Welcome, all you wee lads and lasses. <laughs> it's the thirty one. It's a thirty one. All right. This is the fucking bunny rabbit's hole. The fucking's added today. It's just his. That we just wanted to set the style, the trend, the mood of what we do here at the Bunny Rabbit's Hole. If you've never been here before, we are well, I am Jason, and this here is, of course, my co host. Craig. 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 The Craig. It's the one and only, the Craig. All right, so what we do here at the Bunny Rabbit Hole is we take one theme each and every week, and what we do is we talk about that theme until something inspires us to talk about something else. When we talk about something else, we talk about that for a while until Craig finally says, shut the fuck up, and he stops looking in the mirror, and then we go back to what we're talking about. Right. And as Jason said, we picked that topic, and depending on what the topic is, we will research both sides of it, not just what fits our narrative. Um, this week, that's not the case. But we also include our opinion because this is Greg Entertainment, and we're really fucking entertaining. <laughs> and if you don't, if you're easily offended, we don't care. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so today is the unofficial second part. Yes. To our Sean Connery episode. Yeah. Yes. Sean. We talked a bunch about. Pre Bond, Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, Craig had this great idea. Let's watch one of these films, and he chose it, and we watched it, and now we're going to talk about it. So I'm going to let you introduce it. So we decided because you know we're an adult podcast, we have foul language. So why not review a Disney movie? Yes. With being Derby O'Gill and the Little People. And the Little People. The Turdy yeah. Little People. Starring one, a Sean Connery, next to a Janet Monroe and Albert Shirt. Yes. Now, it's on, it's on Disney Plus. It's free if you have Disney Plus. It's, it's a quite little film. Yes. I gotta uh, say, I... I've watched it like four times in the last few days. Have you really? Yeah. It, I watched parts of it over. I watched the whole thing once, and then there's certain parts I went back and watched again because either a they did make me laugh, or b I was like, man, this is fucking dark. Yeah, it wasn't huh. like Watch Mojo had it in their ten darkest um, live action Disney movies. Oh, okay, I could see that. So, real quick, Darby O'Gill. And the little people, and the little people, is a it was it was the American production of a London based. Uh, it was cast. This film was cast in London in 1959, shot in Hollywood by by Disney, and it's the, it was a uh, Robert Stevenson directed this film, right? And uh, and it had Janet it Monroe. Written. It was written, um, the screenplay was written by Lawrence Watkin, and I believe the original story is written by Hermine, Hermione Templeton Cavanaugh. Yes. Now, Robert Stevenson, if you didn't know, actually directed a lot of um, well-known Disney and Disney-esque films from back in the day. He did uh, Mary Poppins. Uh, he did... Uh, King Solomon's Mines, Herbie, Herbie or the Love Bug, Herbie Rides Again, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. So, so he's got a long list of movies from from this era. So he's well established, and we know we know Sean Connery. But then I want to talk about. Well, let's talk about the movie before we go. Well, before we get too far into this, we need to clarify something. Yes, it is Robert. Stevenson, not to be mistaken for Robert Louis Stevenson. Yes. <laughs> Big difference. Yes. <laughs> yes. I just I wanted to clarify that so there's That's... nobody going, what the fuck? I thought you no, no, not the same guy. <laughs> not not once an author. <laughs> yep. And right. before we get too far, I, I've got to do the uh I'm gonna play something. 
it's if I can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, while, you're, while you're doing that. Yep. Uh, so this came out in 1959, in June, June 26, 1959. It came out the same year as the original Shaggy the Dog, the Shaggy Dog, Zorro the Avenger, the Third Man in the Mountain, which also had uh, Miss Monroe in it. But it also was the same year that Sleeping Beauty came out. Right. Which was the fourth, the sixth, the sixth animated film from Disney. Right. I'm, I'm hoping all of you will be able to hear this. I'm going to play this real quick. Have you ever seen a seagull? Can you hear it? Yes. That would be a, a one Sean Connery singing with Janet Monroe in a duet. My bonny Irish gal. <laughs> He's got a good voice. He does. <laughs> now, I equate him to Gaston from um, it, a less it, asshole version of Gaston from uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast. It is so funny that you say that because I, after watching the movie, I watched a bunch of YouTube clips of people reviewing the movie. You know, other people like, reviewed yeah, this fucking movie. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, bunch okay. of like one girl who is actually Irish and in Ireland who just spent the entire time complaining about the accents. <laughs> <laughs> and like, uh, oh shit, I got lost. What what were you talking about before? You're viewing the movie, and uh, we're I, I was talking about uh, Gaston. Oh, Gaston, yes, one girl actually said. He looks like Gaston. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> that's that's what it reminded me of in the yeah. in the film. But he's See, a I nice. I would say dude. the other guy would be more good. He, the other more guy more. was I forgot what his name was. He was the asshole. Pony Seguri. Yeah. That was his character name. He was played by one Kieran Moore. Yeah. Because uh, you have to have an antagonist. Yes. You you have to and. Now, oh wait, I got the. Is it protagonist or antagonist? Pro uh, antagonist is the bad guy. Okay, yep. I always get those two mixed. Yeah. So he was kind of. I don't know. He was just like a smarmy prick. Yeah. He was he like was uh like, He was like James Spader from all those '80s films. Yeah. Like Blaine, you know, he just sat in back and just made these snarky comments, but he had a lot of money and power behind him, so people, like, feared what he said. Yeah, but he was the town bully. I mean, he bragged yeah. about, like, beating up everybody in town. Yes, and when Sean Connery was first going to beat him beat him up, Janet tells him, he'll hurt you or something. He'll, he'll... Okay, but her name in the movie is Katie. Katie, yes. Little Katie. Little Katie. Little Katie. But, yeah, so... Well, let's start from the beginning. So, Darby O'Gill is played by one Albert, Albert Sharp, Sharp, who I really enjoyed his performance. You know, for a you know seven tooth, you know, uh, but he wasn't a drunk. He was Irish, no. but he played the Irish drunk. But he wasn't a drunk in the movie. Right, right. He was at the he pub went. all the time, and Katie does explain that well, he didn't drink. Well, he drank, yeah. but he didn't get pissed drunk. Right. Well, and he, he basically had stopped drinking after his wife had passed, her mother. Yes. So, Darby O'Gill, um, who likes to spread tales of the little people. Mm -hmm. So, that's he what he would do. Was, he would go, this, this dude would go to, the go to the pub and tell these wild stories about him and leprechauns. Right. So, I'll let and, you go. Sorry. Yeah. So... Him and his daughter, Katie, were the caretakers for a mansion of one Lord Fitzpatrick, Play, played by Walter Fitzgerald. <laughs> Odd. Yeah. But so they had to take care of this. Well, the Lord Fitzpatrick had decided that Darby had gone. So I, I, I can't resist. Yep. There's an old joke. What do you call two Irish gay guys? What? Gerald Fitzpatrick and Patrick Fitzgerald. 
<laughs> Sorry, but it's, it's an oldie. It's an oldie. Don't hate me. I'm not homo. I, it, it's a, it's more of an Irish slam than it is a, a, a gay slam. So go ahead. So Lord Fitzpatrick decides that Darby has gotten on in years, and it's time to replace him. Mm -hmm. So he comes into town. Um, the beginning of the movie starts with um, Pony's mom, Sheila, who was just a fucking bitch. She yes. was one of those conniving. I mean, she looked like she could have been Donald Trump's mother. She she looks like the witch that gives Sleeping Beauty the apple. Yeah, like Donald Trump's mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same color, orange and everything. Um, <laughs> But, so she is basically, her son is the town bully, her son is Pony, mm -hmm. um, and she is a manipulator. And so she wants to get her son to have um, oh, Darby's job. Yes. So then, so she's plotting that, and then the Lord comes into town, she sees the Lord coming into town, she stops and talks to him, trying to push her son on them while she, Sean Connery's in the cart with them, and they're both kind of looking at her like, yeah, we already did that. And like Lord Fitzpatrick said, this, I, I like this. He, he tells her, he's like, well, I'd rather have somebody from out of town because I think the people respect them better. And that's when she pipes up and says, well, my son has already beaten everybody in the uh, clergy or whatever, mm -hmm. the church members, you know, He's already beating all them up, and he was like, um, "Yeah, thanks for letting me know that." <laughs> As in, no fucking way he's getting the job, and out he goes. <laughs> that makes it even less of getting him the job. Yep. So at that point, Lord Fitzpatrick takes old Shawnee. Oh, Donny boy, come with me, and they go to the manor. And at this point, Darby is in the pub, yeah. telling his stories i'll let you take over from here for so, uh when he arrives he sees katie katie and he wants to know where where darby is and she's like oh he must be out doing it because when when uh lord fitzpatrick shows up the place doesn't look that great no and it looks like he darby should be replaced it's like like he's not doing the job and right. there's all these rumors of him telling wild stories at the pub. And when you're telling wild stories at the pub, chances are there's some whiskey involved. Right. So, so she's nervous when she sees Lord Fitzpatrick and this ravishing young man that's with him, that mysterious man. Right. So she says she's going to run and go, go find him. And I forgot where – said he had, I think she said he was at the stables or something. Well, he went to get his blade sharpened because he was going to – That's what it was. Yes, he was going to get his scythe sharpened so he was he could actually do his job. Right. <laughs> Which so, apparently he wasn't going to get his tools ready until the <laughs> Lord got there. Right. So she takes off to go find him, and that's when it cuts – to Darby in the pub telling his first tale of his first encounter. With King Brian. King Brian, who I liked King Brian. Oh, I did too. That guy put out an amazing performance. Hold on, I'll tell you who it was. King Brian was played by Jimmy Odia. Nice. Now, okay, I want to I want to stop right there because all of these people were cast in London and then brought to Hollywood to film this movie. Right. So now this is 1959. That is a tremendous amount of money a, a, a company is putting together to get all these people, bring them to a sound stage, and find areas in and around Los Angeles that kind of looked like the Irish Hills to shoot this damn movie. Right. So that's, but okay. So now he meets King Brian. Now Darby and King Brian are, are nemesis. Okay. Are they? Well, 
at this point, they are. I'm going to put it at this. They are nemesis, but it is a friendly competition. It is like, to me, it's like the uh, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. Right. Neither one of them would have been as great as they were had they not been against each other from every level, from college to the pros, and right. you know, and then become finally teammates and friends when they're on the Olympics. Right. I see a lot of parallels between the two, where they're they're arch rivals on the on the court, but outside, are they really? Right. So it, it's not like Isaiah Thomas and Michael Jordan. A- exactly. It is not. It's, it's Where Michael not, Jordan's I, ego kept Isaiah Thomas off the Olympic Dream Team. Which right. Is fucking bullshit. Right. Isaiah exactly. Thomas should have been on there. Bobby Hurley was on the fucking Dream Team. Christian Leitner was on the goddamn Dream Team, and Isaiah Thomas wasn't. What the right. fuck? Well, we had to have a couple college people. Whoa. Anyway, so King Brian is put in a situation. He's Darby traps. King Brian in a spot where, and I love what the, I love the whole, how this starts is the first thing King Brian is, tries to do is ask Darby to look away. And, and Darby's like, no, <laughs> that's what well, you do. What? You didn't say how he got there. I didn't, did I? No. And that's important. That's an important plot point. It is. Yes. Going up the so, hill. I mean, you, we were tell, he was in the pub telling a story, um, and you kind of jumped ahead with it. <laughs> How many of them beers did you have, Jason? <laughs> I'm still on me first. <laughs> it's a turdy turd. It's a turdy turd. Break everything into turds. I had a – so, <laughs> side note, <laughs> when I was uh, learning roulette, how to deal roulette when I was a pit boss at the casino – I was taught by this guy who was some some one of the Latino countries is where he is from. Okay. Um, I can't remember which one, but anyways, so he was teaching us. He's like, you break it into a turd, a turd, a turd, and a turd. <laughs> I'm like, are people shitting everywhere? What the fuck? <laughs> How many times do I got to slice it? <laughs> right. God, do you want me shitting all over the place? Oh. I got this Anyways, cut the turd. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, yeah, I'm going to stop you there and kind of bring us back to it. So, Darby's at the pub telling his stories. The reverend comes in and says, hey, or not the reverend, the Father Priest. O'Doul. We'll, we'll call him Father O'Doul because I can't remember his name and I'm not looking at it. Up. We'll call him O'Doul. Yep. O'Doul rule. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's Father know. Murphy. Father Murphy, yes. So he's in there, and Father Murphy. By Dennis comes O'Day. In. Yeah. Father Murphy comes in and says that um, the next town over got a new church bell. It's going to donate their church bell to him. So we'll finally have a church bell. If some brave soul who has a horse and a cart can go get it. Because, um, yeah, for, okay. I, for some reason, I was thinking that happened after. No, nope, it was before. It was before. Yeah. Yep. So it, he asked. <clears throat> he asked somebody with a horse because the pre or Father Murphy's like, because I don't have one, would be willing to go to the other town and get it. And um, who's the dickhead again? Oh, hold on though, because this is an important part too. Because he says, because I don't have one, and I'm not going. Yeah. <laughs> the dickhead was Pony. Pony, yes. So. Pony steps up and says, I'll go. How much does it pay? And the, and the priest says, uh, I forgot what the priest said, but he says, uh, I'll do it for two probably pounds. come up with two shillings. Yeah. And then. I think it's more worth two, sh- two shilling ten. Yeah. And then he was like, I would have, I would have gone to three, but. <laughs> And then they, they dicker about this. So it kind of shows you that Pone, he want just he's he's a dick and he's only in for himself. Right. This is when Darby him. steps up. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is when Darby steps up 
and says that he would do it for nothing. Right. But, but the priest says, but the sound of the bell will ring for you. It'll make music for you. Yes, the music will be for you. And he's like, for me, Father? Yes, for you, Darby. I will do it. Yes. As then so, he takes off. Yeah, so then, and at that point is when his daughter, Katie, Katie, busts in yeah. the door and says, Father, we have to go. Lord's at the house, blah, blah, blah. And as they're leaving, you know, he's like, sorry, Father, blah, blah, blah. They go out and he's like, KJ, why did you have to do that? Dress me down in front of the father so like that so much. And she's like, the Lord set the manor, we gotta go, blah 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 blah. <laughs> so they get back to the manor, and this is interesting. This is a really, really cool way to basically fire somebody. To bring in their replacement. Yeah. So they get back there, and as on their way back there. Sean Connery and Lord Fitzpatrick are at the manor and they find a rabbit that's been snared or whatever. And, you know, they're holding up, oh, there's poachers and blah, blah, blah. And when they get there, Darby goes out there to talk to Lord Fitzpatrick. And Lord Fitzpatrick says, Darby, I brought this man here, um, Michael, 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 Michael uh, McBride. McBride. <laughs> Who's a Dublin man? <laughs> that point was brought up several times throughout the movie. He's a Dublin man because even the leprechauns talk about him being a Dublin man. Yes. <laughs> um, so he's a Dublin man, and Darby, you're getting on in age. And as we reach those those certain points in age, we don't need to work so hard. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to retire you at half pay and you'll move to this house over here. So basically, this dude's getting canned, forced to retire, but getting basically what we would call a pension yeah. and a free room and board in another house. Right. That his daughter's allowed to live in also. Right. And he says that if we have, perchance, open the matter up again, KT will be the first one that we contact to come in and blah, 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 clean it up and stuff and get it ready. Right. So, I mean, let, let's think about that. At your job, if you're too old, what are they going to do to you? Uh, just let you go. Yeah. Are they going to promise you anything? Are they going to put a roof over your house? Roof over your head? No. They're going to be like, fuck you. We're done with you. Yeah. Putting somebody younger in who we can pay less. Yes. <laughs> so this was a different time. This was a different means of doing things. Yes. And um, this Lord cared about his people. Mm -hmm. This Lord was definitely not related to Donald Trump. Not Donald Trump does not approve of this message, but I don't give a fuck. Joe Biden does. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so at that point um now the lord leaves and as he leaves he goes through the town where sheila and pony stop him so she can introduce pony to him and he's like oh that he's a big man <laughs> and she's like yes he is and he's like oh, okay see ya bye <laughs> basically that's all he says about him yeah and she's like see he said you'll be you're a big man. You'll have the job before you know it. <laughs> so at that point, we flash back to now what is Sean Connery and Darby? Yeah. And at this point, did we miss Darby, the first meeting between King Brian and? Not yet. That's right after this. Are you sure? Yep. I swear that happened <laughs> when you first tell it. When he was first telling the story, but go ahead. You watched it more <laughs> times than I did, so. <laughs> So at this point, him and Sean are talking, and Sean's like, okay, well, I'm going to go down to the tavern and the inn and book a room and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, you'll stay here with us. He's like, are you sure? And he calls Katie, and Katie's like, and he's like, no, Katie, I'll be in no trouble. I'll go down. And he's, no, you'll stay here. So then it's that getting dark. Stay here. Yeah, it's getting dark. 
and well, before that, he's telling stories of little people, and Sean Connery is humoring him, and mm -hmm. this is Katie off. <laughs> right. So then they're outside. It's dark. The Cleopatra, their horse, escapes. Right. Um, Darby goes to chase down the horse, and Sean's like, well, I'll go get him. And he's like, no, you stay here and check the doors and windows on the manor twice. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets interesting, because he follows the horse, who is actually what they called a puka. A puka, yes. Yeah. And a puka is a creature of Celtic folklore considered to be bringers of both good and bad fortune. They can help or hinder rural and marine communities, and they are shapeshifters. Yes. Now, there's a really cool effect that they mm -hmm. used for the time there. Now, we just call it a neon filter. Right. But for, the, for 1959, it was, a, it was a pretty cool effect. Yeah, it was high tech back then. Oh, yeah. So he finally finds Cleopatra, and he gets up there, and he's trying to woo her in, and then she turns, looks at him, and then, are you frozen? No, I'm not. I just wanted to fuck with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, no, so this is when uh, he, he, this is, I forget, this is when the King, King Brian part. Yes, this is what, because... The ho this is when that effect comes in. Okay, right. Because the horse turns and looks at him, and the horse is whinnying in a weird way. And, and it looks like it's going to hit him. Yep. And then, okay, yes. So then he sees he sees and chases King Brian into like a little corner. No, no. <laughs> You're jumping ahead again. <laughs> Okay. This is when he falls down the well. No, we missed a whole part. We missed a whole part with the, the, the third wish. That's after that. No, before the well. That was before the well. The fourth That's wish. It. The fourth wish is early. Oh, shit. I watched this thing four times. The fourth wish is before he goes to the, before he goes down and plays the violin. I thought it was after that. That was early. Oh, no, no, you're right. You're right. Okay, so because I'll do that part real quick. Yep. So <laughs> he captures, or he, he kind of corners King Brian, who is the king of the, the little people or leprechauns and right. others. So he finally does this, and King Brian's like, hey, look over there, motherfucker. And he's like, I, I'm motherfucker. I'm looking right at you because if you right. look away from a leprechaun, that gives him a chance to take, take off. Right. So he's like, I caught you. You need to grant me my wishes. So he says, okay. So um, I don't remember what all the wishes were, but one was one was a pot of gold. Health. Health. Gold. And there was another one. But uh, King Brian's like, okay, look. You're a worthy adversary. I appreciate everything you've done. I'm going to go ahead and go and grant you another wish. I'm going to go ahead and let you w do some more wishes. Right. So uh, uh, Darby's like, okay, uh, I'm not a greedy man. I'm a good guy. So what I want the same pot of gold for this guy, this woman, this guy. And so King Brian at that point starts laughing. And he says, I grant you wishes, big or small. I grant you, but you wish a fourth. You lose them all. I grant you three wishes, big or small. Yeah, three wishes. Yep. Ask a fourth. Lose them all. <laughs> and then at that time, Darby's like, oh, fuck, god damn it. Yep. And then th the pot of gold goes away. Yep. Okay, yep. now to Cleopatra. And then she yep. rears up, and boom, Darby yep. falls down a well. He falls down a well, which is really odd, because from the outside... It just looks like a regular well, but when he falls down it, he is spread out lengthwise with plenty yeah. of room to fall down this thing. And he's laying at the bottom, and two leprechauns go, I think he's pig dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to I talk about the well for a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Okay. Why the fuck would you put the well at the top of the hill, the farthest fucking point away from the water? Now you have to dig the entire length of the, the hill and then go down to where the water table is. Right. He goes up this goddamn mountain and falls in a goddamn well. Who the fuck right. is digging a well at the top of a goddamn mountain? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. But he did it. It's the magic and wonderful world of Disney. And apparently in Ireland, that's what they do. So right. he falls down. Now there's oh. two little people that meet him at the bottom. Yeah. See, now, I remember where I fucked up. Because it was when he was telling the story in the pub that flashed to him getting the wishes. Yeah. yeah. My bad. Sorry about no worries, that. No worries. No worries. I was a little confused there. Like, oh, maybe I, I wasn't drinking, was I? No, I watched this fucker. <laughs> but I only I, did watch it once. I, I'll freely admit I was stoned the first time I watched it. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Remember the quote about the three wishes. Yes. Grant you three wishes, big or small, but ask a fourth, lose them all. Right. So he falls down the well, and um, he he wakes up. They take him to King Brian, and he tells King Brian that my father told me stories about the little people, and there's three or four things they love: um, dancing, hunting. And, and drinking. Yes. And I, I think there might have been a fourth one. I can't remember it. But, yeah, the hunting having to deal with uh, chasing foxes. Right. And so King Brian's like, well, why don't you play us a song? We have a harp right here. He's like, no, nah, I'm not really good with the harp. Um, because at this point, also, before all that, King Brian had, had said, you're here with us. Because they cast the come hither on him. Mm-hmm. And that's how he. Ended, that's how why Cleopatra let him up there, the Pookie or whatever, and knocked him down there. And now he's basically he has to stay there forever, but he doesn't want to leave Katie. But yeah, yeah. Now he's technically their, he's their guest, but prisoner at the same time. So he's right. kind of like Renfield to Dracula. Right. At this point, he's free to go. But no, he's not. <laughs> he's right. free to roam the grounds, but he can't leave. Right. Yeah. So they're talking about that, and then he tells them that what his father told him, and he's like, um, so the king has to play the harp. He's like, no, I'm no good with the harp. He's like, I'm good with my fiddle. He's like, well, I got a Stradivarius. No, let me, I'll just run home and get my fiddle real quick. I'll be right back. And <laughs> Uh, bring the Stradivarius. So he plays the Stradivarius, which is interesting because the actor had no idea how to play, and they got somebody who did, who was basically stood behind him, put his arms through his shirt, and played the fiddle for him. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yep. Wow. So that's that's kind of like uh, the the movie Crossroads, not the Britney Spears one, but the one with Ralph Macchio, where he has the the devil went down to Georgia moment. You know the the guitar Crossroads Robert Johnson moment. And he's playing against Steve Vai, but it's not its right. not Ralph Macchio playing. No, because there's no way in hell he could play. There's no fucking game. way the Karate Kid's playing like that because he would have been in a lot more shit if he had some talent. Right. Yeah, because Steve Vai is, and when it comes to those types of solos, is one of the best. <laughs> oh, fuck yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so they bring okay. him... But the, but the song that, it's funny, the song that he plays to get them to get him going is a song called the fox chase right which he keeps picking the tempo up because they're yeah. all dancing and he and he continues to increase the tempo until they all get on their horses and go on a fox hunt and they like do this fucking mosh pit on all these little mm -hmm. white ponies just yep. circle that's the goddamn circle pit old school fucking throw down circle pit dri motherfuckers just just they're getting all amped up, and then they just run right out of the gut, and the fucking mountain opens up. They fucking flood out, and Darby's like, "Shit, I'm gonna start." He starts filling his pockets with gems, and then he realizes that the gate to get out of there is starting to close. Right. And he can't run very fast because he's weighted down with gems and gold. But. Apparently, he never sewed up his pockets because they were running out of it the whole time. <laughs> the whole time. The whole time. It was like a Disney – it was like a Bugs Bunny movie. I know that's a Warner Brothers thing, but, you know, you, it just shit just flying everywhere. Right. So, 
he gets out. Um, at this point, now we flash to morning with Sean Connery and um, Katie. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll call Michael McBride because that was his name. Michael McBride and Katie O'Gill. And um, they're wondering where um, Michael McBride comes in and asks Katie, where's your father at? I don't know. His bed hasn't been slept in, but he'll be here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his bed hasn't been slept in. But uh, that's usually some one of those things that you refer to as like, yeah, grandma's out with the meth again, so maybe she'll be back tomorrow. Yeah, when got booty call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's, he's out with widow, what's her name? And Right. So, it, oh, oh, I just got lost. So, uh, yeah. Darby's Law. Uh, so, okay. <clears throat> This next little bit with uh, – no, uh, sorry, I got lost too. Because this is when they come back and say, hey, you fucked with us. Right. And right. he's like, he's like, nah, uh, Darby's like, nah, you know, hey, have a drink with me. Before that, though, um, it actually is where the courting of – Michael and Katie. Happened. Yeah, I just kind of want to miss, skip over that part. But that's when the the song came in. My oh, okay. Irish gal. <laughs> but yeah, but, but then we'll get to the. So they flashed this full courting scene with Sean Connery and Jessica Monroe, and then it's Darby at his barn, and I'll let you go ahead. Um, Darby at his barn. Yeah, isn't that where he uh? That him and King ran in. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I forgot the location. So this is where uh, uh, he he starts. Uh, he he talks the king into King Brian in Brian, right? Yeah. Yep. Talks King Brian into having to having a drink with it, and then another, mm -hmm. and then another, and then what do Irish people are known for? They're just like hobbits. They like to sing. Right. So they started and doing. The uh, drink was Putin, which is a traditional Irish distilled beverage. Oh. Sorry. No. <laughs> I knew oh, it's cool because they did drink a porter in the pub. Yeah. A stout. Or, what's that? A stout. Oh, it was a stout. It was a stout. Never mind. It was yep. stout because he couldn't, because uh, Pony could no longer have whiskey, but he could have a stout. Yeah, because he was insulting Darby about his stories of the Lopey. Yeah, because he's an asshole. Yes. Well, anyway, they start drinking this and then they start doing uh, limericks. Yes. They're singing limericks back and forth. Oh, I wish I had time to sing you a song, but when I get started, I sing all night long. <laughs> and they, then they sung, they did. And it got to what eighty two, something like that. <laughs> it was, I was like, for uh, where are we at? Uh, eighty two. Oh, I wish. Uh, oh, I wish all barmaids were were like Mary McCluskey. McCluskey, when she sent, served you a drink, why she served you a good whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but Mary, she, but Mary, she married poor Jimmy McQueen because she wanted her name to rhyme with protein. <laughs> Where are you getting this shit from? Oh, they're, uh, I am, uh, I, I looked it up. Okay. <laughs> I've got the whole song. I can go through the whole thing. I was like, Jesus Christ, are you fucking, uh, yeah, you <laughs> forgot that one part, but you're goddamn rain man when it comes to the song. I can do the whole song for you if you want. <laughs> no, it's okay. It was funny, but... <laughs> well, this only... I mean, they didn't actually get up to 86 because there were flashes away. Yeah, there's, so there's they only... do the, the time lapse. But they're drinking... They have a drink for every every limerick that they do. Yeah. Yeah. And... Like, uh, <laughs> one of Darby's, I like this one. Oh, I wish I was married to Old Willow Tunny. She's ugly as sin, but has beautiful... Money. 
<laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, um, do, 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 do. in the drinking game, the Putin, uh, and the capture. Oh, so what he ends up doing is they do this and they do this and they do this, and they keep singing and singing and drinking and drinking and drinking, and all of a sudden, Darby opens up the curtain and it's sunlight, right? So now he can capture King Brian because he's powers are nullified. And he grabs King Brian and throws him in a bag. And then he doesn't do his first wish then, right? No, he says, well, actually he does. Because he, he says. He I does because that's how he holds it. Yep. Yes. I wish you would stay with me for a fortnight while I decide what my other wishes will be. As my first wish will be to protect my remaining wishes. Yes. So then so, yeah. he starts walking around town with this knapsack that's kicking and screaming. And, you know, it looks like he's got, you know, a live cat in a knapsack in his, on his back, which is back then in the 50s is probably what it was. Right. Oh, and then he takes it. Oh, it's, he goes through the whole pub thing again, but. Really, but he he refuses to let he refuses to open the bag, so nobody gets to see into it. And then but he does put a glass of whiskey down there. Yes. And let's and then the glass pops back up when he catches it empty. Yeah. Everybody's but, standing around listening as it goes goop goop goop. <laughs> the the important part it doesn't come until he t he shows the bag to Sean Connery. Right. Or Mr. McBride. Michael McBride. Mr. M Michael McBride. So he shows, he shows the bag to Michael McBride. Now it's getting darker at this time. So he's like, oh, I'm going to, okay, fine. Look in the bag. He opens up the bag. Michael McBride looks in there and it's a hair. He's like, no, look again. Yep, still a rabbit. Oh, I wish you could see him. Granted. Yes. <laughs> and because anybody who's ever role played or anybody who knows anything about the twisted power of wishes. Yes. And it's also with, we've talked about law of attraction, the power of the universe. It's all kind of the, the same type of game. If you're not specific to the exact thing that you need, you're going to get fucked with. Right. And that's exactly what happened in this situation. So, so how did King Brian fuck with Darby, Jason? He did because he because uh, Michael McBride saw him in the way that he thought he was going to be, right. which was a rabbit. Right. And then when Darby looks in, he's like, well, you said my wish was granted. And then he's like, and it is. He saw me in my form as a rabbit. Yes. But he will see me in, in my true form tonight in his dreams. In his dreams. Creepy as fuck there, I'm going to tell you. I, right? I, 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 I'm <laughs> glad you said that because I was like, no, wait a minute. So what the fuck are you going to do with him in the, in the dreams? And why is he going to remember? Because this is, everybody dreams every night, but you don't always right. remember. Right. So what the fuck? Are, are, what are you going to do to make sure this dude remembers you in a dream? Right. So at this point, we flash to Sean Connery sleeping in a bed. Yes. And King Brian pops in. And, yeah, basically wakes him up and says, hey, I told you you'd see me in my, your dreams. Here I am, blah, blah, blah. Um, go get Katie, make her fall in love with you, do the bonk to bonk, bonk, and then, you know, have, have kids, get married, blah, blah, blah. Do what you guys do in the, in the uh, whatever time this period this was, the 20s and yeah. 30s, the 1800s. Yeah, at one point, King Brian, <coughs> excuse me, and Darby have a conversation about if Katie could find her true love and fall in love and settle down, would Darby 
you know, because Darby didn't wish for gold or anything like that. They had a whole conversation about it. He's mm -hmm. like, she doesn't want the gold. She doesn't want this. You know, I just want Katie to be happy. Well, he made this whole point. Uh, he made this whole point about um, when, or I think this is later actually, but I'm going to bring it up now. Is he? He has thought about wishes more than probably any person in Ireland. Right. And he under, he at this point understands. I mean, we're going to do a deep character dive right here. He understands the power of wishes and how it truly can affect the person on a, on a huge level. Now, one of the right. things he tells one of the people at the pub was, sure, you can wish for the largest mansion out there, but you didn't wish for the money to upkeep it. Right. So you're yeah, going right. to be the loneliest person in the biggest house in Ireland. And the poorest person. The poorest person in the biggest house in Ireland. Right. So... It's it's important to understand that this guy is seeing he he truly is a wish granter's adversary at this right. point. Now they're they're throwing I mean this is this is Ali Frazier here, man. I mean they're throwing haymakers and they're hitting each other all the way through this thing. Because right. they, I mean they're truly they're the frenemies, I guess is what the best you could say. They respect each other but they don't want to let the other one have the upper hand right and yes. go, no, ahead. go ahead and so go ahead. um so the the point the point was i was going to make with all that is uh it's it's cool to see i mean this is 1959 you're seeing depth true depth within a it layers within a character that Otherwise, could have just been, you know, a throwaway character and a lot of other the this character could have been a throwaway character in so many other stories. Right. You know, he's he's Norm from Cheers in Robin Hood. Right. You know, type of shit. So so it, it was cool to see the growth of the character throughout it and the adversarial uh uh playful rivalry that king brian and and darby had but at the same point after the dream you start seeing the growth of michael mcbride yep. yep and up well, until this up until that point michael was he was a very middle he, he shit he was in it it wasn't even in it for he was in it for like 30 seconds right twice well, in the first 45 minutes of the movie well in something that we didn't bring up earlier is darby had talked michael into not telling katie that michael was his replacement right michael was his his helping hand yeah and so we also there was another part um between all the darby and king brian stuff where mike while michael and katie were courting they ran across pony Mm -hmm. and um, Michael was getting ready to fight Pony, and then Katie jumped in and kind of pissed and Michael off. Him, I'll never talk to you again. Right. And Michael's like, I don't need you to fight my fights for me. And she's like, <laughs> oh, he would have clobbered you. And you're like, you think? <laughs> really? Yeah. Have so, you to me? <laughs> right. I'm shocked. I'm fucking James Bond, bitch. <laughs> right. So now we go back to Darby and the King and, you know, they're going back and forth with all this stuff and he's got the King as his basically prisoner. <laughs> right. And they're going about their life and um, lost track. Sorry. But he, so the conversation that he has with King Brian is how can I make my daughter happy? How can she live her life better than I did? You know, how can she have a better standard of living than I did? Essentially, I mean, in a nutshell. And, you know, obviously at that time, you know, the, the storylines all on those is you have to find your Prince Charming. 
You have right. to find the one and right. then everything is going to be happily ever after. So right. that's kind of the same vibe that's going on here is, you know, let her find somebody that she can fall in love with or not even fall in love with, just find somebody she's going to marry and then, then fall in love. Yeah. And this is when it gets really fucking twisted. Yes. Because at this point, now Sheila, Pony's mother, intercepts a letter from Lord Fitzpatrick that says that Michael McBride is taking over for Darby. Yes. And she's talking to her friend at the pub and going, oh, should I tell, um, what's her name, Katie? Oh, what should I do? <laughs> well, like, but, yeah, and, she, and the other lady's response was, well, wouldn't it be a good Christian thing to do to tell her? Yes. How fucked up is that? Yes. It's a good Christian thing to do and go tell this girl that she's being evicted from her house, getting kicked out, has no hope, no no future, no nothing. Yeah, that's a good Christian thing to do. Yeah. Oh, oh, you homeless little devil, you child. Yeah. Sorry, princess. Right. And one thing we forgot to mention is at the beginning, um, she, Pony's mom was... Sheila was telling Pony that he needs to get with Katie, and he's like, well, if I had that job, I'd have my pick of any girl. And she's like, but Katie could help you get the job. Yes. So you need to sleep with her to get the job, and then you can have to pick whatever girl you want. Right. So now at this point, um, Sheila shows up and tells Katie, mm -hmm. who is now pissed off, and now Michael McBride shows up, and She's pissed off at him. Yep, and she's like, "What? Well, no, no, no!" And he's, like, she's like, "Well, I don't want. When are when are we supposed to move out?" He's like, "Well, it was supposed to be today." Yeah. Oh, you don't well, give us much notice. Thanks for the notice, <laughs> Dick. <laughs> right. And he's like, "It was up to me. I don't want the job unless it comes with you and your father." And he was trying to explain to her the deal that they had, where nothing changed. Right. Because, so the whole thing really was, if you go back to the original deal, um, Lord uh, Fitzpatrick was yes. going to send them to go live in a different house. Right. But Darby didn't want to do that because that was the home that his daughter knew. Yeah, she he didn't want to move her. It didn't, and that's the home that her mother lived in when she, when they, when she died. So right. he didn't want to move from that home into another home because that was her childhood home. And right. the, the Lord said, but she'll get to know this other place. Yeah. Michael That's McBride it. heard all of this. and was pretty much saying like, you know, I'll live in the other fucking house. I don't give a shit. Right. Make the same money live over there. You two live here. I don't give a fuck. Right. But yeah, yeah, how long would two weeks be enough? He's like, it could be longer. Yeah, it could be longer. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting paid to watch you pick weeds. I don't give a fuck. But anyway, uh, so when she attacked him about it, she did the stereotypical trope thing that women do in this is the facts that she knows. This is all that she's going to listen to, and there's nothing that can change her mind. Right. Now, that's – unfortunately, that's still something that stands in movies. It may actually happen sometimes in real life, but that's one of those little little things that still happen in movies. It happened then, still kind of happens today. Is one of those things that won't won't ever change, is that yep. a scorned woman cannot be reasonable. <clears throat> right, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Right. How many times have we heard that through our life? Uh, and, and and every rom com. And, yeah, and it's pretty much bullshit. Yeah, because. Women are not these unreal, reasonable creatures that you cannot talk to. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, both sexes are the same when it comes to shit like that. Right. You yeah, know? I 100% agree. But, so, she's pissed off at Michael McBride. She takes, er, he, so he goes to find Darby, and Cleopatra runs off again. Yes. So she ha she goes off to find Cleopatra, 
and because she wouldn't let Michael do it, and so Michael goes to find Darby so they can save her. Yes. And he finds Darby, and they go after her, and they find her. She's got a fever. She's sick. She's unconscious. And then the uh, the Dulahan, the Dulahan. Oh, the Banshee. Yes, go ahead. You do the Banshee thing. So that's when uh, a, a wailing sound, a screech. There's a and. Darby's getting freaked out because he said, that's the scream of the Banshee. I've heard it one other time in my life. The night her mother died. Right. So when they when he runs up the hill to uh, to go after his daughter, that's when the Banshee's there trying to come after her daughter, his daughter. He fends off the Banshee, and then they get her down there, but the Banshee's still wailing, you know, when they're when she's in the, the thing, and that's when we see the cart. Yes. And the, the Banshees, they use the same type of effects on it as they did the horse earlier. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, cart, the cart as well. The cart and as it well. Was, it I was forgot the, what the cart was called. It was called the Death Coach, and it was driven by the Dulahan. Dulahan, okay. Yeah, the Which Death is, Coach. I like, it's a metal, that, that's it's a cool metal, metal band name. Death Coach. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's and Death it, Clock, but... Right. The Dulahan was a type of mythological creature in Irish folklore that was, and it was headless. And it was basically like Charon, you know, the death drug, you know, leading you across River Styx. Right. Or like the Grim Reaper coming to collect a soul. Yeah. Exactly. So the coach is coming. Darby's freaking out. He does lose his daughter. And he, so he calls upon. And he, he's already made two wishes. Yes. He's so he yelled for King his, Brian. Yep. So he calls upon King Brian, and he wishes that he could take Katie's place in the coach. And Brian because says, King Brian here? tells him, as soon as the coach comes, it does not leave without a, without a soul. Right. And he's like, and King Brian's like, are you sure? He's like, yes. I. It's much better for the old to die than the young. Yes. And so at this point, he grants the wish. Darby gets in the cart. Well, it's cool because when the when the cart stops, the carriage driver, the Dullahan, says, "Darby O'Gill, enter." It doesn't ask for Katie, right? It asks for Darby. So, so he gets in, right? And as he's in the coach, and they take off, he's sitting it by himself, and he's. He's scared, but he knows he did the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he's conflicted because he did the right thing. He saved his daughter, but he knows his daughter's unconscious, so he can't say goodbye. Right. And it happened so fast that he can't even tell Mike, Michael what had happened. Right. And because and, Michael had actually taken off with Katie. He's yeah. Michael's, Michael's hanging out, or not hanging out. I'm hanging out. No, Michael is caring for Katie in in the bed. Right. She's unconscious. Yeah. And he's being midwife, nurse, doctor, right. pra- you know, nurse practitioner, <laughs> whatever the fuck you want to call it. But he's he's hanging out with her. So, you know, Darby's like, fuck, man. I saved my daughter's life. But we missed something before they all that happened. Um, Sean Connery got hit over the head with a bottle and knocked out. Oh, Pony did that. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. Cause yeah, Pony Pony smashes him over the head with a bottle. Right. And then all this happens, and because Darby had found him past or unconscious and thought he drank himself unconscious, he's like, "No, I got hit over the head." Then you go to find all this. Because so, Tony left the bottle with him like he was unconscious. He was he was drunk, hoping that Lord Fitzpatrick would see him in right. that state, passed out with the bottle, so that he would fire him and then hire Pony. Right. So now Darby's in the coach, heading off to the afterlife. Yes. And King Brian pops into the coach with him. Yeah. Oh Darby. You've been such a great adversary throughout our whole lives, and now I'm losing you. But I'm feeling mighty generous. 
Would you like just one more wish? I, I wish I could. <laughs> Granted. And that would be your fourth wish. <laughs> Which, it, you know, there's those moments in film where you just want to clap, cheer, jump up, and you see it happening. You see what's coming up the avenue. It's like, oh my God, is that, is, God damn, it was a fourth wish. All this shit goes away. Yep. And but, that's the feel good moment that's in every Disney movie from that period through like the 80s. Yeah. And, but in true 50s fashion, all of this stuff goes. And there's, there's not really a happily ever after at this moment. Right. Darby wakes up in the mud. <laughs> yep. And he's, and he crawls out of the mud, and the first place he starts heading is towards the pub, towards the town. Right. And they're like, well, uh, go ahead, because I, I forgot how he gets from there. So he wakes up and King Brian's there and he asks about Katie and he's like, Oh, her fever broke as soon as he got in the cat the carriage. That's okay, that's right. Yeah. Katie's fine, so he heads to the pub. And who would meet him at the pub but Michael McBride. Yep. And so they go in or no, he goes in the pub, Michael McBride comes in after him. Yeah. And oh pony's there and he goes in the pub and people are like, No, you he starts to tell us he's starting to tell another tale. And Pony starts fucking with him. It's like, you know, man, you weren't, you weren't like riding a death in the death coach. You were walling right. in the mud. Right. And he starts. And... Go ahead. Oh, he he starts going off about uh, or the the townsfolk, especially the the barkeep. You know, starts defending Dobby because they they always did. They did earlier in the movie. They did this yeah. time. They start coming at him. Then Michael McBride pipes in and says, I think I would like to hear more about the little folk. Yes. And, and, and then, like, go ahead. And then when he says, I'd like to hear more about the little folk and King Brian. Mm -hmm. You know, up until this point, most of these people had never seen him in the pub. Right. They'd never heard They've never seen him and Dobby in, or Darby in the pub. Like he's seen Dobby like he's from fucking Harry Potter. Right. Darby in the pub. And so how the fuck does he know the name King Brian? Right. And it's interesting. The dialogue in this part, I really enjoy. Because Sean Connery says, yeah, I met King Brian. Yes. Because I thought he had hit me over the head with a bottle. And... He said that um, it wasn't him, but that no. you should that you should face the consequences of it. It was you. <laughs> yeah. He's like he said that I should pass the consequences on of that on to you, and he's like, and the Pony's like, well, what are the consequences? Well, King Brian suggested that I punch you in the face. I punch you in the face. I love <laughs> that part. <laughs> and so at this point, Pony goes to swing at. Mike McBride, he blocks it, punches him in the face, knocks him down. They go back and forth. Pony, of course, grabs a bottle because he's a cheap shot artist. Yes. Swings at him. Sean Connery blocks it with an arm. It shatters over his arm, which fucking hurts. Yeah. And so Pony's getting the upper hand, and Sean Connery pushes him back, and punches him, and he falls on a table, collapses the table. He tries to get up and passes it up. Yes. Which is, uh, you know... For a 1959 fight, it was like a epic bar western brawl where somebody does the whole epic, oh, and then boom. Right. And they try to make one last gasp, but no, he's down for the count. Yep. Yep. And then at that point, at, it's at that point, it's it's poetic and it's also a poignant to say, the church bell starts ringing. Yes. And Darby says, my music! Yes. <laughs> and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? So then it's Darby dri driving the horse and cart with Katie and Michael McBride in the back singing a duet, My Pretty Irish Girl. Yes. 
happily and then credits roll <laughs> ever after which is funny because uh when i was watching the reviews mm -hmm. you know the different people reviewing it the irish girl that did it at the beginning of it because the credit opening credits back then were like 10 minutes long oh if you watch the opening credit if you watch the beginning of the goddamn movie it was everything yeah and <laughs> it was like and she's like oh my god these credits she's like there's no way kids would sit through this today. No. They can't even, kids can't even read. How are they reading all this? I'm like, okay, kids can read. Let's calm the fuck down. Yeah. No. <laughs> the, what I, okay, so when I watched it, I'm like, so the whole movie is an end credit scene? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was long. But back then, I mean, when, like, when we rented movies, We'd pop it in, and if the credits started rolling, we'd go hit the bathroom and shit and come back and grab our popcorn and shit and come back as the credits were ending. Exactly. But you had to hit play first because sometimes a scene would pop up before the beginning credits. Yes. So you'd sit through that scene, then the credits would roll, you go get your shit. Yeah. You know, because... we want to watch credits. And to our credit, when you're like, well, why don't you just pause the movie, go get all your shit and do that? We rolled movies all day long. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when one was done, the next one was in, and that's, you know, that narrow window is when you had, otherwise, there were there were too many of us to stop, and then we would have watched half the amount of movies that we did right? if we would have done all that shit in between, because it, it, it told you, you better fucking hurry, yeah. or you're going to be behind. And we were all assholes enough to say, oh, you should have watched it. Yep. And then we got to the point also when you would VHS of like, all right, movie's over. Hit rewind. I'm hitting the can because I got plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But so that was, I'm going to ask you, because we've now reviewed the entire movie. I, we may have met, we probably, we probably missed a lot of shit. But yeah. what did you think of the movie? So... The story was the story was kind of cool, and for a movie that came out in 1959 that I'd never seen before, watching it for the first time in 2020, I actually really enjoyed it. Right. I mean, so, I watched the whole death carriage scene twice because I thought, you know, to, by modern standards, it's fucking cheesy as hell, but just going through what they had to do to create that scene, I thought it was pretty fucking cool. Right. And this is a movie, folks, that you, if you have Disney+, Plus, you can watch it anytime for free. Yeah, it's, either, it's, it's only an hour and a half long, and you can right. fast forward through the first 10 minutes, which is all credits. Well, there is some, um, some writing that you need to read at the beginning of it. Oh, yeah, well, read that stuff and then go. Yep. But, yeah, once you see the names start going through, then just fast forward. But, because the great thing about Disney Plus is they got that, you know, skip forward 10 seconds or skip back 10 seconds. Yes. Um, but, for me, I really, I love this movie. It I'll was good. It, I mean, I'll give it four stars out of five. Okay. Um, I'll give three reason, and a half out of five. My reason being is, it's 1959. Yeah. There is a scene in this movie where during their courtship of uh, Michael McBride and Katie O'Gill, where, you know, Michael's like, oh, you don't want me? She's like, who says I don't? Or yes, I do. And she's just being that whole girly girl, you know, right. playing with emotions thing. And you, you have Darby and King Brian that are watching them, and they're both going, kiss her, kiss her, kiss her. And he doesn't, so he starts walking off thinking she doesn't like it because he's not the type that he's going to push himself on somebody or something like that. Right. He runs up and kisses him. Yeah, which is, at the time, that's that wasn't common. Right, and this is before they, anybody had cars. Yeah. You know, I mean, grand movie came out in '59, but we're talking about this is probably something in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is when the right. story took place. That's when so, the story took place. It, even for when it came out. I mean, let's let's think of Back to the Future for a second, okay? 
How shocked was Michael J. Fox to find out that his mom was the one that was being, you know, sexually aggressive towards towards guys? You know, right. it just that wasn't that wasn't the norm. Right. You know, proper women didn't do that. Right. And that was in the fifties. Yes, and that was in the fifties. <laughs> But this is a movie made in the 50s about a movie made in the late 1800s. Right. So, I mean, for that, the character development, the intricacies of the story, the special effects for the time were were groundbreaking. Yes. And And they still hold up. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. When he's fighting uh, fighting the Banshee outside of his, his carriage house, Trying to keep a, keep the banshee away from his daughter, and you you got this guy jumping around swinging at nothing. But I mean, obviously we can see it, but he can't. He did a great job. Yeah, fight fending off a banshee that he's not seeing on motion capture screens next to him when he's doing it, like you right. can do today. Right. Yeah, and it's just. For me, that's why I rank it so high. I mean, did Sean Connery didn't put on the best performance, but it wasn't a bad one either. No, yeah, it was. It was I mean, fair. He, he he wasn't the main character in the story. The main character in the story was Darby O'Gill. Yes. Who put on a phenomenal performance? Yes. Um, Katie was good, and Katie if if people haven't seen this, but they've seen Swiss Family Robinson, mm-hmm. she was in that. So, okay, I want to talk about her for a minute. Mm-hmm. So, I my my mom talked me into watching Swiss Family Robinson when I was like eight years old. She right. said, "You're gonna love this." And then, so we watched it, and I fell in love with the movie. I'm like, and she's like, "You're gonna want to live in a treehouse after this." And then when it was done, I was like, "Why the fuck do we live in a goddamn trailer?" Right. <laughs> you know, oh, like, because half of Louisiana lives in trailers. But that's not the point. I want to live in a goddamn tree like they do. Right. But I had a crush on her from this movie. I, I, I did. I'll admit it. When I was, I was like eight years old, I had a crush on this woman. Yeah. Little did I know <laughs> that this woman died before I was born. Oh. Yes. Janet, uh, Oh, Janet yeah, Mo- she- or Monroe had a tragic life. Yeah, she, I was um, like five months old when she died. Okay. Yeah, she died before I was born. Uh, she ended up dying of a heart failure or a heart disease at the age of 38. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's- um, she had a rough, div- a rough marriage when she was younger that led to a a miscarriage and she ended up becoming alcoholic because she was trying to keep up drinking with her then husband. And it really put a strain on her body and, and stuff. So it's, it, it's really, uh, they ended up divorcing in 71, but she died two years or like a little over a year later. Right. Um, You know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that there, but, one thing I wanted to point out is when you look at Net Miss Monroe in this movie, and then you look at early um oh fuck, what's her name? Uh the chick that was in the second parent trap. Not Haley uh Haley Mills, but uh Lindsay Lohan? Yeah, Lindsay Lohan. You can see definite similarities in the two when clean Lindsay Lohan and and then and then Miss Monroe you could see definite similarities so it's like it's kind of funny that the reason I want to point this point her out that I'm not saying Lindsay Lohan was all that attractive at that time but Disney had a type and they've kept with it this entire time because you look at Monroe Haley Mills, Lindsay Lohan, you know, they are very similar. And, you know, you look at the Disney princesses, 
and there were there was no diversity. In was it, those. Was it that blonde girl that was in Sin City, who had passed had passed away from drug and alcohol? Wasn't she a Disney girl? Which one was that? I want to say Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy. I don't. Th I don't know if Brittany Murphy was. I don't know if she was a Disney. I'm gonna find out. Yeah. But she had that uh, same look too. Yeah, she had the same look. Uh, yeah, she died. She had a type. I'm gonna go through her filmography. You keep talking. She was in something wicked, but I don't think it was the same thing. Mm. So, yeah. So Disney definitely had a type, and then you look at some of this, like the the pat or the you look at somebody like uh, Spears and Christina Aguilera and some of those others that were actually uh, in a net food cello. What? Was Happy Feet a Disney movie? Yes, it was. She did voice acting in that. Okay. Um, but I'm looking at I'm I'm trying to get to her early stuff to see if she started out. To see if uh, she was a Musketeer. Right. Uh, and she was in a lot of movies. She was in the Prophecy too. Oh. Uh. She was in, yeah, she was in Sister, Sister with the uh, um, African-American twins. That was Nickelodeon, though, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a Nickelodeon one. Basically the same thing. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they, she was they, in Kids Incorporated. Yeah, they, they steal from each other, so. Yeah. To me, like, a Mouseketeer is the same as a Nickelodeon. Thing. Yes, but... <laughs> The way I was going with that, it's like it's it's unfortunate that somebody like this died at such a young age. Mm -hmm. Thirty eight is thirty eight is too young to die, especially right. for heart disease. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a feel good mo movie. I enjoyed it. I watched it for what it was. It reminded me of my childhood of like the spaghetti westerns because it had the same type of campy fight in it. Yeah. Right. Definitely. It was. It was a throwback that was uh, it was welcome, you know. It was yeah. it was a good choice of a movie to watch and to review because yep. it's not it's one that I would have watched, you know, thirty years ago. It's harder for me to watch something like that today, just because I have such a short attention span anymore yep. that I need something that's going to be like, you know, I I. I'll admit I need a documentary that's that's way the fuck out there, or I need uh, a movie like John Wick that's brainless and it's just fucking action from one end to the other. Right. Yeah. Um, you know what? You know what this movie spurred me to do? What's that? Because at the end of it, it recommended the Errol Flynn Robin Hood, so I watched yes. it. Did you? Yep. <laughs> right. And it, you need to go back bad. and watch it. Listen to our Robin Hood episode. Right. Um, it wasn't bad though. Oh really? Yeah, I'd never, I've never watched it before, so I'm like, well, what the fuck? Why not? It's an hour and a half. The, and see, that's the glory of something like Disney Plus is putting all these archived movies mm -hmm. out there for you just to watch. And there's, right. I mean, if I could re recommend a few others, Apple Dumpling Gang, go watch it. Uh, the Incredible Mr. Lippet, watch that. Don Knotts is a goddamn fish. He's a yep. cartoon fish. People, come on, it's Don Knotts. Right. Or if you don't know Don the, Knotts, go look up. Uh, go look up the how Don Knotts cannot make a, a prank phone call. <laughs> it's but, it, it's hysterical. But, I'm I mean, looking also, at you, you made the window. <laughs> check out the the original um, Escape to Witch Mountain, not the one with the Rock, but the original. Oh yeah, yeah, really good. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen the Rock version, so I can't compare them. I've, I've seen them both, but also, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it's, you know, it wasn't what I grew up with. Right. And, you know, I would actually ask you, go watch Mary Poppins, watch Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. These are yeah. actually, they're really good movies. Yep. Um, another one you should check out, especially if you're a horror movie fan, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Yes. The first Disney movie that showed a boob. Mm -hmm. 
True story. Yep. True story. Yeah, it was, it's a it really it's a, it's it's creepy and it's really good. Yeah. It, the it, black it, hole it, is another good one. Yep. So. Um, if you want really depressing, watch Bridge to Terabithia. I wouldn't recommend it because I hated that fucking movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Goddamn trolls. But, yeah. But anyways, I guess to sum up tonight's episode, Jason and I watched Dark Big Gale and the Little People. It was turdy turd. <laughs> yep. There was a bunch of turds. There was shit everywhere. <laughs> 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 So yeah, so go, if you have Disney Plus and you got an hour and a half, why not? It's got Sean Connery in it. Right. And a brilliant performance by Jimmy O'D as King Brian. Yes, yeah. It, it, there's, there's singing in it like there is in all old movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I did too, actually. I did too. It's, it's a fun movie. I recommend it. Just watch it. It's only an hour and a half of your life. You waste yeah, more of that shit just staring at your goddamn phone. I've had the the melody to that um, Irish pretty Irish the limerick. Stuck, <laughs> no, the pretty Irish girl one stuck in my head. Oh, okay. And let's point out one more time: Sean Connery, a Scot, playing an Irish guy. Right. From Dublin. He's a Dublin man. Yes. Because even King Brian at one point says... He's a Dublin man. I would expect more from a Dublin man. (laughs) So, real quick, there's a a movie called the... uh, um, Not the... uh, Fuck. Not the Replacements. uh, Fuck. It's an Irish... It's by Alan Parker. It's a movie about Irish... uh, Blues or uh, soul. Hold on, I'm look up Alan Parker film. Yeah. So uh, the one guy is talking. He puts together this Irish uh, soul band. He's like, okay, so Dublin or Ireland is the blacks of England. Dublin <laughs> is the blacks of Ireland. Right. West, the West Side is the blacks of Dublin. And then this street, well, I forgot what the street was, is the blacks of this. So say it once, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> did you know Alan Parker did, did Angel Heart? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. So what he did fame in 1982. Uh-huh. Uh, what, so, around, around what year was this? Did the, is there the replacements? Uh, um, it's like 89. The Commitments? Commitments. Jesus Christ, yes. I saw that movie. <laughs> it was a 1991. Yes. That's a great, great movie. And an amazing soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, this guy has directed some outstanding movies. Mississippi Burning, Angel Heart, The Commitment, Fame. Granted, that was, I think, the TV series. Now, they started it with a movie, didn't they? What? Fame? Yeah. All the way around. It was a, it was a Broadway play first. Then it was a movie, right. and then it was a TV show. But he, he, um, yeah, like he directed Pink Floyd, The Wall. He did. I was just gonna say The Wall, Avita. Yep, Avita, The Road to Wellville, something called Melody. He did a lot of music stuff, movie wise. Yep. yep. Yeah, I would definitely. I mean, he did me. I got his own round thing of guitars. <laughs> But the commitments might be one of my favorites of all of his movies. Yep, I remember watching that. I think, that, yeah. But so, but anyways, anyway. yeah. Tonight we, Jason and I, took a, a trip down memory lane to memories that happened before we were born. Right. And we <laughs> talked about a movie. We reviewed a movie longer than the movie was. Right. Right. <laughs> But we had fun doing it, and we hope you had fun listening to it. And if you didn't, I'm surprised you made it this far. <laughs> if, you didn't, if you didn't enjoy it and you're still here, that's that's on you. Yeah, well, I, I say kudos to your conviction. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep. Insert so, tagline here. 
peace out. Love you guys.